Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is Tom Farden. I'm the organizer and chair of Grand Rounds. Uh, thanks very much for attending today. Um, as part of the program this month, we kicked off. It's Black uh, Black History Month, and last a week we we kicked off with um, with the inequalities uh, and some and injustices that have surrounded COVID and COVID vaccination. With um, three excellent talks from uh, Professor James Chalmers, uh, Ellie Hodesall, and, and and Danny Chandler. That uh, that video is cooking in the YouTube editing suite, um, and by the end of today, you should be able to watch that if you missed it last week. We're continuing the um, theme of justice, injustice, inclusivity, exclusivity uh, with one of our medical students, um, Sri George, who um, wrote to me earlier in the year asking if she could uh, possibly present at Grand Rounds. And of course, we're delighted to welcome uh, our students along to, to Grand Rounds. They're a key part of the community, um, and we're always delighted when they uh, attend Never mind speak. So now that they, if they want to speak at Grand Rounds, we're, we're absolutely delighted. Um, so uh, Shri has done some uh, qualitative research into cultural diversity and inclusion in UK medical schools. Um, this work is due to be published. Um, has it been? She, she'll tell you, no doubt, if it's been accepted and where it's coming out. Um, so I don't think this is embargoed in any way because it is about to be published. She worked uh, locally with Kevin McConville. Um, and uh, nationally with some names on the screen. And she's going to talk to us today about the work she's done in cultural diversity and inclusion in UK medical schools. Cherie, thank you very much indeed for being here. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Farden. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sherry, and I'm one of the fifth year medical students at Dundee. And today I'll be presenting about the cultural diversity and inclusion in UK medical schools, which is a piece of research that I did um, in collaboration with the University of Glasgow and as well as the Imperial College London, as well as Dr. Kevin McConville, which is from Dundee. Um, moving on to this, to sort of why this um, research was done, it was really done to explore the perspectives of heads of teaching of primary care on cultural diversity and inclusion across UK medical schools, what their thoughts and opinions are on how this can be improved in the years to come. As many of us will know, uh, medical students from racial minority backgrounds experience less positive learning environments and increased incidence of discrimination negatively impacting on their sense of belonging and contributing to the attainment gap. And it was really about how can we address these disparities and ensure that students of all races and of all uh, skin colors and staff are equipped to, to care for an increasingly diverse population in the UK. So how this study was conducted was that we um, approached heads of primary care teaching at different medical schools, which were, which were 37 individuals and 23 out of the 37 agreed to participate in this piece of research. They were then split into five focus groups with three to five participants per group. And somebody from the team was there to run questions and have an open discussion about various issues. And the actual um, the meeting was recorded and then it was then transcribed, it was anonymized um, and it was actually transcribed by someone, a, a third party and then um, deduced which is a software that we can use to qualitatively um, do coding from sort of transcripts was used to analyze the, um, the various focus groups and what was said. Um, myself, uh, another medical student from Glasgow University as well as um, Dr. Dominic Forrest from Imperial College were then, um, we then transcribed and sort of looked through the various themes that um, came out in the various focus groups. And then we came to a common consensus as to what kinds of themes that we saw sort of jarring out at us. And if, you know, if there were any discrepancies, or sort of if I thought it was A and Dr. Forrest thought it was B, and then we, we sort of had an open discussion about it and came to a consensus as to what we thought it would be finally. And um, we then wrote up the entire uh, publication or sort of yet to be published um, write up um, on uh, together as a team, all of us together. And we um, had a discussion if there's any disputes. And at the moment, as Dr. Farden mentioned, it's not been published yet and it's still undergoing a couple of edits before we're trying to publish it with um, the clinical teacher. So a couple of the main themes that came out uh, was a lack of faculty diversity, tokenistic faculty training, 
mindset, um, diversifying the formal and hidden curriculum, as well as intersectionality and the student voice. So in terms of lack of faculty diversity, participants really highlighted the lack of diversity among staff, especially in senior positions in the medical school. For students having role models in senior positions show students that color doesn't limit our progress in medicine and that there's an equal opportunity for everyone. Participants mentioned that there is more diversity in GP positions like themselves and that than there is within medical schools, especially within senior management. The change to increase diversity within the staff must be an active one. And we have to really sort of see why people of color and minority races are not taking up these senior positions. What kind of barriers are in place and how can we break down those barriers in order to make it something that's more attainable? It has to be um, active recruitment and you know, are they applying for jobs and losing out because there's a lack of training and they're not able to um, attain it in that way or could there be underlying biases in current policies in play? And these barriers can be different in every medical school and so hence it differs and every medical school has to assess it for themselves. The next theme was tokenistic faculty training. And I think in the last year, there's been a lot of, of, of talk definitely about diversity, inclusion, racism, and how we can be, what, how we can improve it within the NHS and as well as educational institutions. Diversity training should never be done as a tick box exercise. And just because it looks good and sounds good doesn't mean it has to be a robotic exercise and something that has to be done mandatory. Um, the materials used for training should also be carefully thought through in order to send an accurate message. Racial and gender stereotypes should not be used and individuals who are leading the sessions should also be very well trained, knowledgeable and well read about current literature and issues regarding diversity and inclusion um, and aware about implicit bias themselves in order to um, be able to answer any questions that people might have during training as well. Particip participants mentioned that training would be useful with the integration of role play, sharing of personal experiences from individuals with open discussion to discuss views Re and research highlights that the faculty may avoid discussing these kind of issues because it's a very sensitive issue and they might be uncertain about how to approach a topic or sort of ask a question in an open discussion where other people might turn around and go, how could you ask that? But sometimes in these kind of situations, um, it's better for someone to ask something in a sort of safe environment and understand um, the reasoning behind that or be able to get a good answer as compared to not knowing the answer at all. Um, and this inadvertently contributes to the hidden curriculum as well. Mindset was one of the biggest things and biggest themes that sort of came out through this um, piece of research. And it's no surprise that changing the mindset of individuals is one of the key and core messages that came out of this. Institutions need to acknowledge that racism is still prevalent within institutions as well as the workplace. There needs to be a visible way in which there's a response to this to show people that this is a serious offense and it's not gonna be taken lightly. Mindset of senior leadership is, a cru is crucial in instigating these changes and these issues should no, no longer be taboo and um, Individuals like staff or students alike should not be fearful in bringing these up to anybody. Some of our participants felt that the problem is still not recognized, while others feared that raising the profile of these issues could damage the institution reputation should it come out sort of in the public eye. We should always be looking towards other institutions for examples of good practice and how we can learn from others, as this is not just a problem in Scotland or in Dundee, it's a problem in the UK. Sharing, sharing in this way could really be a way to instigate change on a UK-wide level. Letting students know that the larger institutions see these issues and understand them is very important. And what changes are being made to tackle these issues, letting students know that these changes and showing accountability increases the trust in the institution and shows com commitment to tackling these larger issues. Now we come to diversifying the formal and hidden curriculum. And this is essentially a lot of the work that's being done in Dundee is from the, um, after we've signed the BMA race charter and diversifying the curriculum is essentially making the medical curriculum who it's really meant for, which is for everyone, regardless of the color of your skin. This is currently being actioned through, as I mentioned, the race charter. 
and who is working to increase the diversity of simulated patients and clinical skills, the mannequins that you, that's used, the images and lecture materials, the type of um, impression we give about certain diseases that perhaps are stereotyped to be prevalent in certain races as compared to others, how it's being taught and the tone of voice that is being taught so as to not to segregate one race against the other. We need to teach students to treat a diverse population and to treat everyone with an equal heart and an equal mind. And the cu curriculum needs to actually really reflect this. And this work is undergoing um, change, especially with the new curriculum coming in place as well. Now we go on to intersectionality and there will be a video about this that I'll show a little later on. Um, there are several issues in terms of, sometimes when you look at diversity and inclusion, we think about um, a race issue much different to an LGBT issue or a, or a sexism issue, but actually um, several issues can overlap when talking about diversity and inclusion, and it can be more useful to talk about these things together than separately, especially when we're doing faculty training or talking about it towards to, to the student population. Looking at the different factors um, that may overlap um, to proliferate and perpetuate marginalization um, will be really useful so that students can get a wider idea of the things that are going on and how to tackle it. Um, and this includes gender, race, sexuality, and everything that um, you know, comes under this category. The student voice um, is another big uh, category. And I think that um, students have been very vocal about this issue. As you can see, a lot of people have been doing separate works regarding, the, uh, to, regarding issues of diversity and inclusion and being advocates in their own way regarding um, these larger issues as well. The student voice should never be silenced, and it's one of the most important voices that um, you can hear, in, in, especially in an educational institution. All medical schools, as well as hospitals, should have a safe place for students, as well as staff, to report incidents of racism, share experiences of discrimination, and this was echoed across all the focus groups. Discrimination such as racism and sexism continue to go underreported. And a recent BMJ investigation just last year showed that only half of UK medical schools recorded incidents of racism. This was also seen from a survey that was done by the MSc Student Council in Dundee earlier this year, which was presented at SSLC. And the implementation of the BMA race charter that was signed by Dundee sets out clear standards as to how we should respond to racial harassment at an institutional and individual level. This is a large step towards tr tackling discrimination and we have to have student champions who are you know aware of how to tackle it when you see someone going through this or you hear about someone um you know experiencing this or if you you experience it yourself how we can encourage uh, people to report this and not feel fearful and that's um you know we can do anonymous reporting as well if people are more fearful of of sort of calling out senior people who are, who may be in their um, clinics in the future. Um, and when they report it, I think it's very important that they're not second guessed as to did that really happen? Are you sure? Did that person really mean it in that way? Or are you misinterpreting it? I think that for someone to bring up um, an issue such as this, which is very personal and is very sometimes shameful and embarrassing to bring up, it should definitely be listened to and to be um, sort of given that amount of importance that's necessary. So this is the most important thing as to how we change moving forward. Um, medical schools share similar challenges in this area, and that's UK-wide, and ongoing collaboration to sort of meet a, a similar need and a similar problem would be able, would give us a chance to share examples of good practice um, in terms of moving forward. Medical schools should take action through policies which facilitate recruitment of racial, racially minoritized colleagues, and we, we should also reassess aspects of our curriculum to ensure that it's inclusive and it does not show discrimination towards minority races. Um, and lastly, addressing reports of discrimination tactfully and ensuring that adequate action is taken leading to visible outcomes would allow students to feel more safe and as well as staff members to feel more safe working and learning in a, in a shared environment. So that's all the slides I have, um, but I'll just stop my sharing and just um, share a YouTube video at the moment. And Dr. McConville will then come in to share a couple of things. Um. 
identity is a way of understanding social relations. What is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a way of understanding social relations by examining intersecting forms of discrimination. This means acknowledging that social systems are complicated and that many forms of oppression, like racism, sexism and ageism, might be present and active at the same time in a person's life. Everyday approaches to building equality tend to focus on one type of discrimination, for instance, sexism, and then work to address only that specific concern. But while the career of a young, white and able-bodied woman might improve with gender equality protections, an older, black, disabled lesbian may continue to be hampered by racism, ageism, ableism and homophobia in the workplace. Intersectionality is about understanding and addressing all potential roadblocks to an individual or group's well-being. But it's not as simple as just adding up oppressions and addressing each one individually. Racism, sexism and ableism exist on their own. But when combined, they compound and transform the experience of oppression. Intersectionality acknowledges that unique oppressions exist, but is also dedicated to understanding how they change in combination. The roots of intersectionality lie within the black feminist movement with legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw originating the term. Crenshaw felt that anti-racist and feminist movements were both overlooking the unique challenges faced by black women. She stated that legislation about race is framed to protect black men and legislation about sexism is understood to protect white women. So simply combining racism and sexism together does not therefore protect black women. Intersectional theory is now applied across a range of social divisions and also to understandings of domination, such as those associated with whiteness, masculinity and heterosexuality. Intersectionality is not only about multiple identities and it's not a simple answer to solving problems around equality and diversity. It is, however, an essential framework as we truly engage with issues around privilege and power and work to bring them into the open. Intersectionality means listening to others, examining our own privileges and asking questions about who may be excluded or adversely affected by our work. As importantly, it means taking measurable action to invite, include and centre the voices and work of marginalised individuals. Okay, thank you everyone for your attention and I'll just pass the time to Dr McConville to see if he wants to add any additional comments. Thank you very much, Sheree, actually. Maybe we'll go back to just to your summary slide of the PowerPoint uh, just yeah. to help a bit. Um, I, I just wanted to add on a little bit um, as one of those um, kind of conducting the focus groups, um, but very much impressed by Cherie and her student counterpart in Glasgow who very much um, stood up or were actively in terms of thinking about student voice as much as that was a theme that came out from the focus group research from the heads of general practice teaching within the UK. Um, um, underpinning that, Cherie um, and her colleague were very active at looking for opportunities to try and identify exactly the same issues and then help move things forward. Um, so all this work is really her um, hard labour and, and, and she should be very proud of that. Um, just picking up on the intersectionality element a little bit more, um, the reason that came up in the discussions within the Heads of Teaching was um, it, it was interwoven, uh, and thus why it's a kind of theme um, that became prominent. Um, the concern from heads of GP teaching was that in trying to create bespoke piece, pieces of teaching that with a clinical head on might identify particular case studies, how we do that without appearing tokenistic. Um, so for example, so not wholly focusing on dermatology, conditions per se and then demonstrating that difference but how how do we do that raise awareness about issues centered around ethnicity racism but then uh, not ignore other protected characteristics or other elements which are not within protected characteristics but kind of circumvent that so for example social deprivation etc so there was much dis discussion within the group about how um they wanted to achieve a bespoke piece of teaching that helped to address a clinical topic 
um, paid attention and maybe created focus and protected a, a protected or one or two protected characteristics, but acknowledged that it was more complicated to that ally intersectionality. So it was a it was a recurring theme that we were mindful of. And I'm not certain we have necessarily any particular answers. And indeed, one of the questions I'll hand over to the audience. Um, this work and these themes are very much centered about how general practice is currently thinking about teaching and how it's delivered via GP departments and our various um, uh, UK institutes, but I'm very keen to know what other um, specialities think or how they may be doing it as well. Hopefully we can draw on your good practices um, and experience as well to see how you might be readdressing that. And so under, underpinning a lot of that was the curricular element as well, both these overt teaching opportunities, but also um, reminding us about the kind of work that Hafferty talks about in terms of that hidden curriculum. How do we demonstrate that by role modeling these same examples, the things that we don't say, but just happen in the background of the teaching uh, as well within that. So it was quite complex. Um, and so for Shri uh, and the team to be able to tease that apart and present it in a way um, that's more simple to understand and, and has been eloquently put, um, uh, she's done an excellent job of it, and we wholly expect a clinical teacher to present uh, to uh, to be able to publish that in the near future. They're just looking at um, a few minor editing issues to tackle the wider UK audience. Um, so I'm going to kind of hand back to Sri and or Tom at this point. Um, um, but certainly my question to the audience, and you may have your own, um, is how um, some of these themes might occur within your own. Um, elements of teaching under clinical practice and how we can continue to adapt, change, and build on these. Um, and certainly, what we're interested in today. Thanks very much, Kevin, and to Shri for, for that really, um, a, a, a really great, great piece of work. And um, from a postgraduate education hat on, uh, the, you know, this pervades in uh, throughout the uh, not just undergraduate, postgraduate, and career things. Um, we have a in the deanery, we have an entire street work stream on differential attainment. And the ch challenge is, we've been spent a lot of time trying to work out why there is differential attainment and an awful lot of time effort got into why is it people from BME backgrounds don't do as well in certain subjects, um, in certain, why, why is there is that people gravitate to one sort of speciality or another. And, and I think we've realized that we need to get past that and into what are we gonna do about it? So rather than trying to dissect out why it's happened, let's just do something about it and make change. So I, I, I thought your talk was excellent, Sharia, and, um, and lots to take away to think about in terms of our postgraduate work as well as the undergraduate. Um, there's, no, there's no questions in the chat box, but um, we are a compact and Bijou group today. Um, is there anybody in the audience have anything, any comments they'd like to make or, or any questions? Anything they'd like to add to the topic? We, I remember when I was in uh, more embedded in the undergraduate curriculum, when I was SIP lead, we did sp spend quite a lot of time doing what I suspect would now be labeled as tokenism of, of you know, changing cases in the curriculum and making sure that in exam questions uh, there were, uh, John is here with his husband, for example, or um, I, I, I'm putting in names that might be make it obvious that someone is from a from a different ethnic background um hopefully you look at you look back at that and see it as a start to the process rather than being entirely tokenism it was a challenging you know i think it still is challenging isn't it i think you've made that clear that it's not it's not an easy fix otherwise we'd have fixed it um but um but you know we, we i think the steps some steps have been made at least and, and the, the kind of work that you're doing here Shri, particularly if, as an undergraduate, seeing it all happen around you, I think is really invaluable. I think it's, it's, it's excellent. I hope you take this forward and, and, and continue to, to provide us with some solutions. Okay, doesn't look like there's any, any more questions from the audience. I think we shall call things to a conclusion. Thank you very much for, for coming today, Sheree, Kevin, thank you very much. Thanks to the audience. I will edit this and it will appear on our YouTube channel. Don't forget the YouTube channel has grand rounds all the way back to 2015 that you can go and watch. Uh, they take a little while for me to edit so there's a little bit of a backlog and uh, but they do if you like subscribe and hit the bell then you get a notification to tell you that um that i've uploaded a, a new video so please please do that um next week sarah allstaff 
um, frequent flyer at Grand Rounds um, has is going to present on the impact that COVID and the pandemics had uh, had on uh, on presentations of sexually transmitted infections and other sexual health related diseases. Um, I think that is going to be absolutely fascinating. What happened to rates of infection during lockdown? Was it the same as all the respiratory infections that basically disappeared? Or is it more complex than that? And being locked in, uh, locked away in a block of flats actually has a different impact on sexually transmitted infections. All will be revealed in Sarah's own inimitable style next week. Thank you very much for coming today and I'll see you again next week. Thanks very much. <laughs>